Okay, let me uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, first thing, let me read. Uh, this is from the town clerk. Uh, the last, uh, asked that the last one in the Lions hearing room close the doors uh, because all of the election stuff is down at the end here. So the last one leaving the room, please close the doors. That's really okay, funny. Uh, that was great. And turn on the lights. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have to turn the lights off too? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Do I have a motion on the minutes? Second. Second. Okay. Are there any uh, corrections or uh, comments? Dean? On the third line where we talk about the CPA committee, um, maybe we shouldn't say they're running late. Maybe cut them a little slack because it's their first year. Or working through their first year process or something like that. It seems like we're kind of. Uh, okay, I suppose. Okay, Peter, I'll leave it open to your diplomatic skills to just sort of smooth that over a bit. <laughs> we'll do. Are there any, uh, any other yes. corrections? <laughs> okay, um, there's a P here that I don't understand. On the second page, budget 19 B police, second line, they will be assigned to traffic duties full time, and then there's a space and a P. Is that just a Here, no. Okay, second line. Second line. Uh, they will be assigned to traffic duties full time yeah. with a space and a P. I must have fixed that. Oh, okay. It just says full time period now, right? Right. Okay. Mine has a P there. Does anybody else have a P? Yeah. yeah. Okay, everybody else has a P, P or a P. <laughs> I'll make sure the P is missing. Okay, any other corrections? Okay, all those in favor of the, of the uh, minutes is Madam modified? Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Done. Okay, our first hearing today is the uh, tourism committee. So, Gloria, can you have them come in? demands for money and that we're asking for more this year. Um, 
what we are asking for, like I said, is our 1775, which is just the usual part, so you can break this all up. Um, $7,500 for a centralized website for visitors in town, because that's the way most people get their information when they come to visit, is they go online, and we don't have anything like that. Um, and I'll go into just a little more detail. And $2,500 to help us support the visitor center, because it's entirely volunteer run. You know, we had asked for the money a couple of years ago, and you granted it, and it's been tremendous, and we think it's a great resource, but it's very difficult um, as a volunteer committee to completely support it. And so we're asking for a little money for help with that. Um, so like I said, we understand that there's a lot of competing demands, <coughs> but like any other department in town, although we're unpaid, we're asking you for money to fulfill our mission. Um, and we just want to point out a couple of things. And the first is that, you know, we don't have any kind of revolving fund, but we look at our budget um, sort of as a percentage of the meals and hotel tax that gets generated in town, because that has to do with people coming and eating in the restaurants and staying in the hotel. So that's how we sort of look at it. Um, and I got that number from Adam, and it was over $732,000 for fiscal 2015. So the total amount that we're requesting from you is about 1.6% of this amount. And given the fact that it's, it's businesses in town that are generating that revenue for the town, we look at it almost as a little bit of a give back to if we can do something to help them get more people in, then that potentially can generate more revenue for the town too. Um, the other thing is, for the last two years, we've asked for $5,000 to support the Battle Road Cedic Byway, which is of course another important part of tourism in the town. And I talked to Clarissa, um, and we do not have a Warren article in there for that this year, so we're not asking for that 5000 So we looked at it from that perspective too. We're not asking for that, but we'd really like to put it toward these other initiatives. Um, so as far as it goes on the website, just a few things. Um, we think we want to look at ourselves compared to our peers. So for example, Lexington. Um, and I looked at some other towns too. If you Google, say, Lexington MA, Marblehead MA, Salem MA, Lincoln MA, I did, you can go to the town's website and you can click on a section for visitors. And you can get a whole bunch of information there about things that are going on. Um, I have examples if anybody would like to see them, but those are the particular towns I had. And they still have the town ribbon across the bottom, but Lexington's a little bit more of a hybrid. I, I think some of them still link out. Um, and I talked to Adam about this too, and he said he understands, who showed him, he's open to the idea. Um, and we don't, we don't want this website for ourselves. We want this website for the town, and we just don't feel, we <coughs> tried as volunteers to do the website. ACAC <coughs> has tried. We just, we can't get a centralized website as volunteers, and that's what everybody that works in this area agrees we need. So we just want the money appropriated. Adam just walked in. We want it turned over to the town to decide the best way. Is it, is it part of the town's website? Is, a, is it a link off of it? You know, we don't, we don't want to decide that, but we think it's important, and we think it should be an initiative of the town. Um, and we do have um, notes of support um, from Beth Walk, who's the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce. And once again, they have their own website. They have members, but it's not centralized. And she says the chamber would be in favor of a comprehensive visitor information website for the town. Increased tourism would be a positive for many of our businesses. At the moment, a visitor in town whether it be from afar or from a neighboring community, must wade through a wide variety of sites, many of which are not regularly updated, presenting a polished <coughs> image and informative hub for the town's many offerings would be a benefit to all. Um, and then we also have <coughs> one from ACAC, which says, you know, thank you for proposing it. And ACAC agrees with the need for a comprehensive, attractive, well-designed, well-publicized, and user-friendly website with a calendar of events um, as the go-to site for residents and visitors alike. Um, she says it not only like, likely to increase the level of tourism, but also likely to increase collaboration and cultural activity in the town. Um, and then Jan Witted from the Capitol Square Business Association says the initiative to develop an attractive, easy-to-use website for Arlington's cultural events is both exciting and timely. Um, those of us who regularly hold events know that at least two-thirds of attendees are from outside of Arlington. 
Now those visitors get their information um, piecemeal from various online and published listings, a site that brings everything together and reflects Arlington's incredibly diverse cultural offerings would um, boost tourism and support growth in our local economy. So they support it. So we'd like you to consider that. And the last, um, and so, and Ted had gotten estimates, Ted Palusa got estimates from people who do websites, and we said, basically, we're like, okay, $5,000 would give us a really professional, good-looking website, and we'd look at like 2,500 for the maintenance part. So I can't say, you know, if you, if you agree to this, we would likely have to include, working with Adam, how much it would cost to maintain it on a regular basis and have someone pay <coughs> to do it. Um, not that maybe volunteers would submit events or something, but we really need a coordinator. Um, and the last piece of the ask is $2,500 to support the visitor center. Um, and I just want to say, you know, bless um, our committee's devastated by the loss of Roley Chappett because um, he was such a wonderful person and he meant so much to us and he was such a big part of the visitor center. Um, and it, it just shows how much volunteers really, really do. We want to have it open as many hours as we can, every weekend as we can, but between our committee and we do have some volunteers, we just don't always have enough help. And so we're asking to have money, once again, can be put under the jurisdiction, maybe of the town manager's office, where we pay somebody on a temporary basis for a certain number of hours to help sort of coordinate, which would mean anything from recruiting volunteers, scheduling them, and actually being there when we can't have somebody else present um, and in doing some promotion because we do a number of initiatives on our committee and it's, just, it's really hard for us to staff it and to run it and to do everything else. Um, and I want to put as an aside for everything we would love to promote, if people don't know, I know Alan does, um, the parade's back this year which is great and even more awesome, we're going to have a reenactment at the Jason Russell House. So the Minutemen have been able to get um, Minutemen from like a, two or three other um, <coughs> communities are coming. And yes, the British are coming. The regulars are out. Um, they've agreed to come. And so on Sunday of that weekend at noon, please make sure you come to the Jason Russell House to see that because we think it'll be really exciting. And like I said, this is exactly the reason we want this is because this is something super important for us to promote. I mean, it certainly will do publicity, but lovely that the history and this event would be on our own website, too. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah, could I, on, on the website, so you said $5,000 is for what, the initial design and yes. <coughs> implementation, and then the $2,500 is for ongoing maintenance, is that? Yeah, maintenance, some the hosting, and I mean, I assume the town would be hosting it? I mean, ideally, and that's, that would be, once again, we would leave it to Adam to sort of decide. You know, we're, we're, we got, Ted was able to get estimates for that number, um, and that was the best, you know, we could come up with, um, Ted wants to say something? Yeah. You want, uh, Adam uh, wants uh, you to ask Adam. Yeah, okay. Uh, I spent about 50 hours researching what websites exist for the town, and there are not. Yeah, in all honesty, if you folks say, I'm going to find out where town attractions are promoted, you will find they are not. They are, even the hotel has attractions listed for Cambridge and Boston, okay? So, but to get back to the work that we did, we talked to three different people about the potential cost. The number you have of $5,000 came from the third person it's high. We know it's high. It has nothing to do with what, in my opinion, you will pay. It has to do with a budget that we provided through the ATED uh, line, only because we didn't think we should go to town meeting. If the town manager can negotiate it for a lot less than that, which I'm sure he can, it won't be $5,000, okay? So that's how we got to the number. Um, Adam, why, how do you see this going? <clears throat> Thank you. So, I, um, frankly, I, I just learned about this in the hall uh, as I was walking in, so I haven't had a lot of time to think about it. But I, I would think, first and foremost, we'd look at the existing web platform we have. 
and see if we can just have it be an add-on page, which would be limited, if any, additional ongoing cost, uh, or, or set up or ongoing cost. I think the, the issues we'll have to work through are um, just the legal issues around what we can promote and what we can't promote. I mean, we can certainly promote arts and cultural festivals like Arlington Live and Feast of the East. Uh, you know, we'll have to look at what we can do in terms of, you know, putting up restaurant listings or, or retailers or whatnot. Uh, but Angela had mentioned that there are other communities that seem to be hosting an attractions or visitor's site on their actual city or town webpage. So I think we can look at those models and pretty quickly see what we can do. I think moving from there, the big question will be, how do we staff updating it on a regular basis so it's, so it's actually question. useful? The, on a website like this, uh, up-to-date current content is that's the, that's the whole game so um, you know if we can't assure that we can keep the content current then we shouldn't do it because nothing will turn people off more than stale data dead links and so on so so we just um, so we rolled out the new website a year and a half ago now and it's a much easier to use content management system our public information officer has trained a pretty wide set of town staff on how to use it. So we could talk about who the appropriate staff member is and then ATED, Arlington Public Art, Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, all of these different groups that interact with these events. We could figure out a process where they would just email whatever it is that's going on, whether it be the calendar event or an announcement, and have that one staff member do the updating. So I think it's, it's workable. We'll just have to talk about it. Do you have the capability within your IT department to create websites, to create the website? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. We're probably not well suited to create a brand new website, but to build additional web pages off our town site would be pretty easy to do. Uh, Alan. I, I, I love the idea of a centralized website, one-stop shopping, and to some extent I, can, I look at it like a, a cart, you know, rack full of cards. It's you know, a traditional tourist center. You have a card rack and everybody's got a rack card in there. And it's the one place to go and, and do everything. Um, I, I, and I don't, you know, I, I try not to nickel and dime volunteer committees because I think it's a, it's a great investment by the town. I, I do think that the world of websites has changed. And as you mentioned, the maintenance, the updating, it really needs to be fresh. And that's where the expense is. And I would, I would like to you know, emphasize that a lot of that budget should be pay someone maybe two hours a week to uh, update the calendar, put up specials on, you know, some pictures of the Minutemen coming, you know, things like that. Putting up the mechanics of a website now are so trivial. Uh, a few hundred dollars a year to host, you can create a, a good looking website, click, 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 at Drupal Gardens or WordPress.com or things like that. I personally think it probably a good idea to not attach it to the town website because I think it can be a lot more flexible and easier to maintain. Something like WordPress or Drupal or is much easy, a much more flexible content <coughs> management system than the one used in town hall. Another aspect which websites like this very often have are advertising. With advertising, it can actually be a, a, a revenue generator. Obviously, you couldn't do that as a town website. So, you know, in, in summary, I guess I'd say really minimize the cost of putting it up. Budget at least one or two hours a week for someone to update it, which could, with the right skills, could be the same person that, that staffs the tourist center. And consider it, and consider the possibility of an independent website with advertising in the sidebar for local businesses. How would you would you have a uh, a, a visitors piece on the town website and then just a link? I think just a link saying you know go here's here's the A10 website. But it's not a town. Because, as you say, you might want to do features on a restaurant or uh, who knows, you know, uh, uh, things like that, but, but certainly special events. Um, similar to the ACMI type, you know, slides that are going up where people would request, could you put my event on your website? Because it's an open house or, a, 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 you know, a, a, an, art, uh, an art display at the Schwab Mill or something like that. Um, I think you could be a lot more creative with, you know, YouTube videos and things like that. It's not on the, the town's content management system is pretty restricted compared to what's, you know, state of the art today. Uh, there's a whole technological aspect, and I, I do, you know, as you know, I do 100 websites a year, so I'm pretty familiar with the technology. Um, 
But again, the important thing is make sure it's staffed to update it frequently. Consider using advertising as a revenue generator, not just to pay for the website, but even to help pay for some of the other ATED's other expenses. I don't know if that's possible for ATED or not. That's a legal question, but again, this much for the website, <coughs> this much for content management. Why doesn't the Chamber of Commerce take this on? Um, they don't, well, one, they don't have the resources. Two, that's a membership organization. So if they did that, they be, would be probably promoting their members. It's like Capital Square. It's a membership right, organization. But, but would they also want to promote things that would get people to come to Arlington, like the Schwab Mill, the Sam, and then the Chamber of Commerce doesn't have to worry about the legality that we would have there. Yeah, I, they only have a part-time executive director. I don't really think, I mean, I don't think they have the resources to do more than they are doing. And like I said, it, you know, they really, they're going to promote their businesses. That's, you know, this benefits them, and, and certainly there's, a, there's some benefit, but they really need to be focused on their membership. So. It seems to me that it would be in their interest to do this. And they, especially they, they could take advantage of advertising. But they can't offer advertising for someone who doesn't belong to the chamber. And like I said, they only, they only have a part-time executive director, so I don't, I don't think they have the staffing either to do it. Okay, Dean? Um, I guess I'm going to go one step over from her question. It might be better for Adam. But um, when I see this, I, I kind of get confused on why we have a planning department with an economic development coordinator if we have to then have a committee do what I would have thought an economic development coordinator would be doing. So how does this all, I guess that's why I sort of get confused. We have, <coughs> I remember creating the position recently of that. They have a budget, and then we have a chamber of commerce, so let's rule them out because they're a private organization. But why would the town's planning department be doing this? So I, I guess I would say first and foremost, I don't see the economic development <coughs> director's position as being the community events organizer. Uh, he certainly plays a role, but I, I don't, you know, it certainly wasn't what any of my intentions were when we created that position. That said, I do think the planning department in some shape or form is where the staff would live that would update whatever kind of website that we're talking about. Um, you know, the, and I'm sorry my, my thoughts aren't more well thought out on this, but I think as I'm listening, you know, so A10 is interested in this. I know in the past, the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture have had interests in a bigger, more you know, uh, easy to access web presence. Uh, the uh, cultural, well, um, uh, the cultural council I think has raised similar issues. APA. So there's there's a lot of these groups that are talking about these things. And when we launched the new website, we did include the community calendar. So you have town meetings community meetings and then all meetings so you can look at everything. It's not perfect by any means. Um, but I, I'm almost wondering if we should have a little bit more of a discussion, sort of a, a cross-functional discussion among these, grou among these groups and see what the actual needs are and what the wants are for a site before we say we're going to, you know, jump ahead with it. I... Okay. Tom? Um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Have you gone to the Arlington businesses and asked them to fund this? Because it's to their benefit. Who, who about who? The Arlington. You, we have, um, you got a proposal for a website to promote Arlington business, businesses. <coughs> have you approached the Arlington businesses in this town <coughs> to see if they will fund it? Because it's to their benefit. Well, no, but we don't, once again, we don't want to run this website. So... As volunteers, if we get the money, I'm not exactly sure what we do with it because we don't have the manpower no, I, to I do the website. You don't want a website. But yeah. that's to, to Alan's point is that if the if the website can be done legally in such a way that we can have advertising, then it could actually get funded that way. But my point but, is this is the benefit the Arlington businesses. Yep. Not to really benefit town of Island. Well it's well, a little bit incorporated, right, but, but, but excuse me. But it's for their benefit the most because they need to generate the money the most so they go into business. Have we approached the Arlington businesses and said, we're coming up with this website or whatever, we, we need this amount of money. Have you approached that? And second thing is, I agree with Christine, Chamber of Commerce is 
this is their, their back. This is them to promote the town, the businesses. Uh, I think they should be, be definitely involved in this. And it's just hard to swallow when, when I think everybody knows in the near future what these taxpayers in this town are going to have to come up with. Yeah, the next um, one yep. to five years, and to and to keep giving, it, it, it's just it's it's hard for me to swallow. Okay, so the first thing is on the the businesses supporting it. I would say that the more than seven hundred thousand dollars that the restaurants and the hotel generate is supporting the town. So there is that money out there right now that that goes right to the town. And the more people that stay at the hotel and eat at the restaurants, the more revenue goes straight to the town. And also, the more people that go to the restaurants and the hotels benefit the businessman. Right, more but they're, than it benefits they're, us. They're, they're promoting. Yeah. So there, there's that aspect of it. I, you know, I mean, we, we could try. I, I can tell you right now, I, I work full time. We, we don't have the resources necessarily to go out and ask, and we would have to do the legal questions. I just, everyone points to the Chamber of Commerce, and I just want to emphasize again that they're struggling, like all the other nonprofits in town, they're a struggling membership organization So, to, with a part-time director. So to keep looking at them to do things, we'd love to give them the visitor center. And they're happy to support it. They're probably going to buy us like a table and chairs or something. They're going to give us some kind of furniture donation maybe. But they don't have, we, we, like I said, we'd love to give it to them. They don't have the resources to take it over. So it's not like we haven't thought about that or we haven't tried, but you know, like I said, to Alan's point, if we can get this up and running and then, you know, and there's resources for somebody to run it and it's legal for them to get advertising revenue, then we could get it supported. It's really hard for us because we're trying the best we can to get people into town. And I know Al always asks me, what do they ask? I can tell you, I've gotten questions for outside dining. I've gotten questions for ice cream. Where can I get a burger and a beer? Besides the restrooms, besides people love coming to the visitor center and they tell us how welcoming it is. And we know for a fact that we attract so many people from out of town off that bike path. And where we're situated, they come right off and they see us and we get to promote the town. So we can't measure in exact dollars, but we know we're making a difference. And so for for visitors to come and for us to generate some more of that revenue and not to have empty storefronts on Mass Ave, because one of our goals is to have a vibrant street life in town, it's the 21st century and we don't have a place where people can go if they're coming here to find out where they can visit or where they can eat or where they can stay, because it just doesn't exist that way. I mean, we had somebody last summer who was doing a genealogy <coughs> trip around New England because he had ancestors in the old burying ground and that's why he was in Arlington. So those are the kinds of people we want to find us and to come and the reenactment is a tremendous opportunity to bring in people from out of town. It makes us competitive with Lexington and Concord. You know, so that's why we're up here and that's why we're asking and I know you'd like somebody else to support it and you know, if we had all the resources to go out and do the research and do all of that, it would be great, but we're a volunteer committee. I think what I'd like to suggest at this point is that um, uh, the Tourism <coughs> Commission, for want of a better term, uh, sit down with the manager, uh, maybe Alan, if you, could, if you could sit down with them uh, and, and answer some of these questions. So for example, uh, you know, would it be a direct, or, you know, a, a direct part of the town website, or would it just be a link to another website? Uh, who in planning would coordinate uh, the um, coordination of staffing the center? Who would coordinate updating the thing? In other words, you know, sort of fill in the blanks. And then, if uh, once those are set, if you can come back and and uh, and uh, come back to that. So if there's any other questions, Charlie? Yes, I have two questions. <clears throat> One is, uh, what's the metric for what we're going to do here? In other words, um, whatever the amount of money that we're spending is, what's going to define that it's been successful or not successful? And the second question is, um, what happened to the Battle Road initiative that we all spent money on? What is that? Okay. Uh, can, can I really say something here? Well, wait a minute. 
we're, we're going to hear another proposal on, on the No, you can give me two minutes. Back. You can, uh, I, I spent the time, you can give me two minutes. What I'd like you to do is answer Charlie's questions, please. I'm sorry? What I'd like you to do, Charlie posed a couple of questions. I'd like those answered. Okay, you answer those questions. Right, right. um, okay, so metrics, the good thing about a website is we'll actually be able to manage hits to the site. Um, the other thing, I'm hoping to get going for the visitor center, if we can, if we can get the manpower together, is um, a program where we could have people come and get like a little discount card if we can get some visit, some, um, it's something like if you've ever been to Haunted Happenings in Salem years ago, you <coughs> could buy like a lanyard and you could come back and use it again. So we'd love to start something, hopefully this year, where if you came to the visitor center, you'd get some kind of card. And if you come back within the next two weeks, you'd get discounts at businesses. And then we could track the card numbers and know that people are actually going there. We, you know, we haven't been able to do anything except measure who's coming in. So we'd like to know that they're actually going someplace. Um, what was the other question? Metrics. What, what's happened to the Bell Road? Um, it, the it's it's going on. They had if Clarissa came to the board of selectmen, I think, with the uh, the logo and the branding. They're working on logo and branding proposals, and I know she showed those to the board of selectmen. She's on that committee, so it's going forward. They just didn't ask for any money this year. Okay. So I, I don't want to get it. into a discussion. I'd rather have you guys come up with some answers. Yeah, excuse me, back. Alan. I, I deserve to be heard. Okay. okay. Now, let me tell you, I've spent 50 hours on this. It's needed. Okay. You're not going to disappoint me because I'm going to be working as a volunteer on this website, helping out to develop it, whether it's with Alan or anybody else. You are going to be disappointing the business community, in all honesty. Now, it's my understanding, and if I'm out of line, you know me long enough to know that doesn't stop me, okay? It is my understanding that this committee is, in, is here to approve a budgetary item. They are involved in getting into some of the details but if you feel that we have to reach out <clears throat> to 50 businesses, not just to the, uh, the, the chamber to support it, not to Bob Bowles to support it, not to the Arlington, not to the Capitol Square people to support it. If you feel we have to do that, then you know what? It ain't gonna happen. And your job, as far as I'm concerned, and I hate to tell you what your job is, but I do know a little bit about government. Your job is to say yes or no to a proposal to put something into the budget. I don't believe your job is to determine every little piece that goes after that. You do have a town manager. You do have people who have authority. They will negotiate contracts if there are contracts involved. They will decide how much they're going to pay and who they're going to pay it. So what I'm suggesting to you is either approve it or don't. It doesn't really matter to me at my age. I'll find something else to keep me busy. So what I'm saying to you is you don't want to work out every last detail. Every last detail isn't worked out. For instance, you want, you want a last detail? I'll give you a simple one. If we make, make uh, $30,000 from the website for advertising, we spent 15,000 of it to help the community by having people sweep the streets instead of putting it into the general budget. What do you think? You think that'd be a nice thing? Probably. So the ideas are going to flow like crazy. They're going to flow from you. They're going to flow from Joe. They're going to flow from other people. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is prove the darn thing. Approve it for 5,000, approve it for 10,000, but please approve the concept. You've got people here who want to get it done. Okay, are there any other questions from the committee? I move no action. I second. Okay, move just, uh, motion is made for no action uh, on the entire amount. The, the entire amount. I'm sorry? On the entire amount. I uh, second. Discussion. <coughs> I, I move to table the vote on that until Adam reports back to us. Um, you shouldn't ask for a vote if we don't have the information to, 
because this is what you're going to end up with. But the concern that I have, and I only can speak for myself whether I vote yes or no for something, I mean, clearly there's a need here, and your volunteers are doing a great job, and, and, and you're really looking for help. Um, I, I look in and say, all right, we've got a position within the planning department, at least on the business side. I'd like to hear some information as to what our economic development coordinator is doing and, and what the town can do to support this. And then when they come back, and Adam comes back after a discussion with you and Angela, let's see what can be done, and we'll take a vote then. But why rush to a vote tonight? Town meeting is until April. Let him do his job and get back to us. Is there, here? Second, second. Is there a second, second to that motion to take? Second. Second. Okay, further, any further discussion? <coughs> Christine? I have a, a motion to uh, approve a budget of 1775. Okay, I've got two motions on the table. If both of those fail, we'll move to that motion. Uh, by the way, is there a second? Well, I'll what's the motion? That. We, we couldn't hear the motion. Okay, so we've got a motion. Uh, first motion is to or, uh, move no action on the entire thing. Second motion was to table. That's been seconded. We'll take that motion first. Everybody understand? No. So the, this, the vote now is whether to table a motion on this. All those in favor of uh, tabling this until we get a report back from the town manager, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, all those in favor of tabling until then, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All those opposed? Three. Okay, the motion is stable. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, efforts. We appreciate you very much. Yes? I would just like to ask that the um, analysis that Adam is going to do also include what these other cities and towns are doing to finance okay. the visitor site. Okay, also. dear women, uh, Adam, this is for you. <laughs> um, so there were um, websites, visitors' websites for several other towns cited. Uh, it would be good to know what they're doing to fund their websites and also what their metrics are. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take a look at that. And again, I apologize. I, as I walked in, I well, learned a lesson. I mean, Gloria tells you to come at 8.15, come at 8.15. <laughs> so I, I heard about it when I walked in. And, and the more I hear about it, I, you know, I, I think the value of what they're looking for is a way to promote events in the community. And that's probably easily achieved. Uh, I also think that the last time or the next time someone books a hotel via a city or town website will be the first time. So I don't know that you know restaurants or hotel advertisements on a city website or town website may make a whole heck of a lot of sense with Yelp and Priceline and Kayak and everything else out there. So I think we need to work through exactly what it is that we want to achieve. Um, okay, well thank you very much. Okay, we have articles now that the town manager has submitted or we might hit him on some comments. Uh, the first one is Article 28, uh, Community Choice Aggregation. Um, first, obviously, since uh, the FinCon I think there was two things. One here is, one, will there be any financial impact upon the town of Arlington? And second, what the heck is this? <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that lead there. There is no financial impact on the town of Arlington as a government entity via this article. So this, uh, this started with the Energy Working Group and um, a private group called Mothers Out Front. 
uh, which is a grassroots organizing group in terms of climate issues and environmental issues. And some of their members from Arlington, it's not just an Arlington group, it's a regional group that has chapters in local communities. Uh, some of their members started attending uh, our energy working group meetings um, and suggested that the town should take a look at this community choice aggregation. <coughs> what community choice aggregation is, um, it was started in 1997 via state law that would allow a city or town to aggregate all of their business and residential um, electricity use and then go out to bid for a competitive supply. So they would no longer need to buy it from the utility. So here in Arlington, if we went forward with this, ratepayers would have a choice of buying it from a competitively bid supply as opposed to from Eversource. So what happens is the, the method or the, the mechanism to make this happen starts at town meeting. Uh, so the way the state law works out, uh, town meeting would need to authorize the community to move forward with community choice aggregation. If town meeting uh, said yes, then we would work to hire an aggregator or a broker to help the town uh, actually go out and, and uh, put, a, put a, a bid out on the market for a competitive supply. We'd also work with that aggregator to put together a CCA plan, which would basically outline what we want the plan to look like, what we want the aggregation to look like for the community. Then that plan is reviewed by myself, the Board of Selectmen. We have a public meeting for people to come in and make comments on the plan. Um, also, while we're formulating it, we have a dialogue with the state's Division of Energy Resources so that they're tuned into the plan. Uh, then that plan goes before the Board of Selectmen for final approval, and then it goes to the Department of Public Utilities for their review. Uh, they hold a hearing, they take a look at it, and if they approve the CCA plan, then an RFP for competitive suppliers goes out. We get prices. We execute the agreement with that competitive supplier. Notice goes out to everybody who's eligible, and you're eligible if you're currently buying from the utility. And you have 30 days to opt out if you didn't want to do it. Um, and the, the basic idea of this, when it, when it first started, this idea of CCA was to get people simply a better price on their electricity as opposed to buying from the utility. As it's evolved over the past 20 years, it's remained focused on a better price for consumers, but also allowed communities to say, we want to buy a larger portion of a renewable portfolio than whatever source of the utility might be selling you. So Mothers Out Front, who is supporting this, will be asking that the CCA plan that's put together has a higher percentage of green or renewable energy included in it than what you know any of us would be buying from Eversource. So, you know, I... Again, it, it doesn't impact the town's budgets. Uh, our electricity buying isn't through this. We do our own competitive procurement for the town's energy uh, as a government. Um, so there's, there's no town financial impact. Uh, the reason I submitted it is we, we sort of went around and around on this of whether they should do a 10 registered voter article, the Board of Selectmen wanted to submit it, or if it should be submitted by the town manager. And uh, based on you know the, the feedback and I guess my you know, I guess I'd say quasi-personal professional opinion that uh, it's a valuable thing to go, to go through to see if there could be savings and an ability to get more green energy. Uh, after a dialogue with the Board of Selectmen, we agreed that I would submit it. Um, that said, I think Mothers Out Front and Sustainable Arlington needs to sell this to town meeting and see whether or not town meeting thinks it's the right thing for Arlington. Okay, are there any questions? John? So, Adam, you said this would be an opt-out aggregation, yeah. not an opt-in? It's, yeah, it's opt-out. And have you thought about, in terms of financial impact, the costs to, for education um, for such a, for an opt-out program? Mm -hmm. Having been involved in some aggregation efforts, I can tell you that there's a lot of education that needs to go on. If you're, if you're thinking about an opt-out program, because people have to make a conscious choice <coughs> to, uh, as to whether to, to stay on the aggregation. Yeah, no, it, it, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Uh, but that, that's a great question. So we, um, in preparation for this, the, the MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, did a competitive procurement for an aggregator or a broker. 
so as an MAPC community, we're eligible to use the broker they selected, and we actually had someone from my office sit on the screening team so that we could learn more about the process through that screening. So I met with that aggregator, uh, Good Energy, last week. We're not signing anything with them until after town meeting has acted affirmatively. Um, but uh, I, I asked that question. You know, what, what are you prepared to do as the aggregator to help us educate, to, to handle these phone calls from people who want to opt out, opt in, or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, uh, or just questions about the program. So in a very preliminary conversation, they've claimed that they are, they've, they've done it in a lot of places and they're fully ready to do that campaign. I think I want to see a little bit more before I'm fully sold on that, though. Okay, Carol, and then Charlie, and then Alan. I, didn't, I hadn't really caught the opt-out part. So every single resident in town would have to either, would have to opt out or not do anything <coughs> to participate in this. So I, I missed the last part. So either they opt out or they're automatically participating. Yes, yes, that's and we'd have to let every single resident in town, owner in town know, regardless of their use of the internet or engagement with the community. Right. And there's no way to make it opt in? No, the, the law states it's an opt out. Okay. I mean, there has to be some guarantee for the application, right? A competitive supplier has to have some guarantee that, that the mass that you're, or the volume that you're stating is gonna be somewhere near that. Right, I mean, otherwise, you know, you could say, well, we have 42,000 residents, but who knows how many will opt in. All right. First question I was just answered, so with how many votes is everybody in it, basically? Sec secondly, um, there are companies out there doing this now, privately. So Correct. why is the town not in the business of competing with private industry? Well, I... I don't know that we'd be competing with private industry, but we'd, we'd be trying to use the, no, the, the mass buy. There's a whole bunch of companies out there that do this. You could sign up for this right now. You could sign up for a different, different energy supply. So why does the town have to get into the business of picking a private energy supplier when the citizens can do it on their own? Yeah, I guess I would say I don't think we don't have to. But it's also an opportunity to get a better price than maybe what those competitive suppliers are individually doing. And, it, and then it also provides that opportunity for the community to say, you know, we want to buy energy at 5% green, 10% green, 15% green, whatever the number would be. How does, how does, how does the, how do you guarantee that the price is going to be lower and that it's going to be, so you can mandate the, the renewable percentage and how, how much, how many uh, RECs, uh, renewable energy credits, have to be part of the portfolio. You can't guarantee the price, but I don't think we would sign on. We, we wouldn't finalize it if the prices were higher than what the utility is charging. Suppose they were later. Well, so we wouldn't do this. Um, you know, this. These would be still only 12 to 18 months. So it would be, you know, if six months later the utility was cheaper, then that would be problematic, but it wouldn't be a long term. You know, we're not signing up for five or ten years or something like that. Alan, yeah. sort of a oh, combination. Sure. Sure, I think. I just, uh, the only comment I would make is, if there's private industry out there doing this, selling, aggregating, and selling, and considering all the demands on the town, why would we want to get into this? As a, as a manager, you know, you've got school buildings, you've got enrollment problems, you've got all sorts of things to worry about. Why would we do this, essentially going into competition with other private suppliers of energy? So I don't see it as all that heavy a load for the town government to bear, Frank, honestly. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've tried to be responsive to a segment of the community that wants to try to promote an opportunity for the community to buy a higher renewable portion of their, their uh, electricity load. Thank you. So let me, let me just have that one. So it doesn't impact, financially it doesn't impact the town. If we go out separately uh, and bid for the town's energy sources. Um, do you see this as a 2% you know, of somebody's time to oversee this? In other words, is there a manager? 
Um, I would think when we initially roll it out, no matter how good the aggregator says they are, we'll have to handle phone calls. So I'll have to get people up to speed on sort of an FAQ to answer questions. But I, I, don't, I don't see there being an ongoing management cost. Okay. Alan? Uh, so sort of a combination of the other questions, and you might not know the answer to it, and maybe even Jonathan does, but uh, I'm wondering about experience in, in other towns. You know, first, uh, what's the, been the opt-out? I mean, the questions I would have are, what's the opt-out rate? Um, and, and more importantly, um, what's the long-term uh, economic benefit to the citizens? I mean, one could, one could, could maybe think that, that uh, with a little bit of competition that it would pressure all of them to keep their rates down a little bit. I mean, I like competition in general, whereas Eversource has a, essentially a monopoly. Competition might help improve things. And regarding the educational aspect, if I were Eversource and felt threatened by this, I would do a lot of education about why people should opt out or maybe the other aggregators. So I, I don't... You know, so I don't know if that happens, but I would expect the other aggregators and Eversource to try to convince people to opt out through education, whether you trust them or not. Um, and I would hope that the competition would bring the rates down. Do you know what happens in the other towns? What, what has happened in other cities and towns that have adopted it? Is there any record? Yeah, there, there's definitely a record. So um, I know definitively Dedham has executed and their rate is below Eversource. Uh, there's, I think, 17 communities total that have already gone full aggregation. Brookline and Burlington town meetings have passed it, but they haven't gone out to bid yet. So I don't know the answer to what percentage of people have opted out or how that process worked. So I, I can I can look into that. Question at all, but you know, I, I guess I would expect that the the advocates for for this article would come with a lot of data about what the experience yeah, in other towns. Point. Okay, uh, keep in mind, uh, I, I think we've established there's no financial impact on the town government of Arlington on this. Uh, so it might not be that the finance committee wants to take any position on this whatsoever and just let the selectmen handle it. So, you know, think about that and sort of limiting the number of questions we get into this. Dean? So, I get there's no financial impact. Just trying to understand it. So it's an opt-out program. So you have to send a notice to everybody to opt out, <coughs> well, how do we how do we send the notice? So we wouldn't send the notice. The the, the aggregator slash winning bidder would be sending the notices. Mail it, create it, yep. get it back, process it. Correct. And then if there's an issue with the residents, they have to deal with it. So if I said that I opted out and I and all of a sudden I got changed, I'd go to the Aggregate. You're saying I wouldn't go to the town. I'd yeah, go to the aggregate. Procedurally, they have to deal with it. Right. Politically, I think they have to deal with it. No, I'm never. I, I get that. Okay. John. And I would just add. I mean, practically, what what will happen is that people will call town hall, yeah. and then and then someone will have to say, "Oh no, you should call this number." But yeah, I think that's right. They, they will. The the aggregator. The supplier will have the, the obligation to handle all consumer relations. Okay, is there any other questions for the manager on this article? Okay, then uh, before we stop, I have a start into the next article. I have a bit of an emergency situation. My glasses are falling apart. Does anybody have one of those itty bitty screwdrivers that they carry with them that I can put this back together again? If they do, if they give it to me for a second, I'd appreciate it. Okay, Article 38. It's in my car. I think that's the other one. Am I allowed to have a knife on? Yeah. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Uh, okay, Article 38 is the appropriation for the uh, MUGAR applic uh, application reviews. So, what is this and how much is it going to cost? So, we put in a request for $25,000, and this is to provide legal and technical help to the ZBA uh, and, and more than likely the Conservation Commission as they deal with. Uh, the MUGAR or the um, Oak Tree 40B proposal. 
so there, um, we, we've already retained the services of Attorney John Witten. Some of you may have seen him at some of the public meetings uh, we've had our hearings. Uh, this year, we're predominantly paying for it out of our legal budget. We may need to come back to the Finance Committee later this year for a reserve fund transfer to balance that out, depending on when the filing actually happens. Uh, and then moving into next year, uh, Doug Heim, Town Council, has been working with Attorney Witten to try to get an estimate of what you know, we think the process through ZBA will cost. If we end up going in litigation, there will be further uh, costs that we'll have to come back to you with. But at this point, uh, we think that that doesn't look good, Al. Uh, <laughs> uh, at this point, we um, at this point we think that for FY17, that twenty-five thousand uh, dollars, we'll be able to support again the ZBA Conservation Commission, both legal and technical help. Questions? Charlie? Yeah, are there any steps being taken by either the town management or the board of selectmen? to have a, um, uh, say, a, a progressive discussion or negotiation with the Mugar people with respect to how that property gets developed? Or is it totally, uh, you know, we're going to fight this to the death, spend all the money we can, and then eventually lose? So I think I can, I think I can safely say that the, the political dynamic has shaped up around fighting this to the end. Uh, but I can say that I've tried to tell anybody who I've spoken to that we need to go into this understanding that 40B is very favorable to developers and very unfavorable to municipalities. And the, the batting average for developers is like 995, right? This is, there's not a high success rate for municipalities. So I, I do think, and I may get criticized for saying this, but I do think there will come a time where we do have to contemplate negotiating with the developers so they don't get 100% of what they want and that we're able to try to, to get a development that at least East Arlington and Arlington can live with. Uh, I, I don't think that the leverage is there yet for, for them to be willing to have that negotiation. But my, my advice will continue to be that we need to be open to that point of negotiation. John? As a developer, don't aggravate it. Go to the negotiating table tomorrow. I'm so sorry. As a developer, don't aggravate them. Go to the negotiating table tomorrow. Because you're going to end up going to the negotiation later, spending money. <coughs> it's going to be aggravated, and you're not going to get what you really want. Now you get all you want. That's just my opinion as a developer. I've done 40B. Probably gotten to the wrong individual. So. <laughs> well, okay, John. So, Adam. So what, so it's an appropriation of $25,000, you say? Correct. And what exactly is your, is your expectation in terms of how that money would be spent with, with you know, in terms of the ZBA? I mean, my understanding is that the ZBA, they, they've announced that they believe that we've met the 1.5% threshold. And so the next step would Again, my crude understanding is the next step is that Mugar would have to dispute that. And so is, that, is, is this appropriation to support the legal <coughs> effort to, in terms of that dispute? Or, or, or anticipate the so, dispute? Thank you. So there's actually a few steps before that. Oh, okay. So, so the ZBA has declared or, or, or issued that 1.5% statement <coughs> in regards to a different application. Yes. to the Housing Corporation of Arlington's yes. uh, Westminster application. Yes. Oak Tree, or the Mugar development, has not filed before the ZBA yet. So my understanding is they're, they're still doing probably a significant amount of engineering work before they're actually ready to file with the ZBA. So once they file with the ZBA, the hearing will open. And, they, and the ZBA will have to hear their permit request. And then as part of the ZBA's response to dealing with that permit, they can again issue or state that one and a half percent. Gotcha. When and if, or more than likely, they will dispute that one and a half percent and more than likely dispute whatever it is that the ZBA issues in terms of their, their decision. That can then be appealed to the state's Housing Appeals Committee. So I would think a significant part of this legal cost will be 
legal advice to the ZBA as they go through the process, and then bridge into the Housing Appeals Committee process. We may also want to use some of these funds for some technical consulting to help with the review of their application, but state law also allows for a fund to be set up for the developers to pay in for a portion of those technical reviews uh, to be done by both the ZBA and CONCOM. So we'll definitely be utilizing that. And, and CONCOM's involvement and use of some of this money, what, what's, what's their role? In so their, their role is because there are wetlands in the area, they, they will have some jurisdiction over certain aspects of the application. Okay. And CONCOM's route, depending on what CONCOM's finding is, their route is to Superior Court, whereas the ZBA's route is to the Housing Appeals Committee. So there, there's parallel tracks. Okay. Okay. Thank Shane you. And Alan. Uh, <coughs> um, litigation is a possibility. Uh, has there been thought to how best to manage our legal costs? And I ask that because just uh, just a few years ago, we took a meeting <coughs> in another matter where, um, in my opinion, I think we lost control of the situation. And before we go down this route, I would like uh, some assurance that we have thought about how not to repeat our mistakes. Has, has there been some thought about that? Yeah, so I, say yeah no, I guess I would say the, probably the biggest difference, but I'm assuming you're referring to that employment matter, the biggest difference there is we, we were an arm's length separated <clears throat> by the insurance company uh, in terms of legal expenditures up to a certain point before it <coughs> kicked over to us. I mean, we were definitely involved, but there was that in-between relationship. Whereas here, town council Doug Heim is working hand in hand with this outside council. And Doug himself will admit he doesn't have you know, the, the years of expertise in this particular aspect of law that this outside attorney has, but he's, he's knee deep in this. So he is scrutinizing every bill that comes in from John Witten and his firm. So I think, I just think this dynamic will be different in that town council will be an active participant. Okay, is there any uh, other are there any other questions? Alan? Yeah. This is just sort of a, a technical question. In, in previous years, when we've had the anticipated uh, extra legal expenses, it's gone under the expense line of the legal budget rather than a separate warrant article. Why, why is this a separate warrant article this year? Um, I'm not sure if that's, is, is that entirely true? I mean, we, I don't know that we would normally. Well, I was looking, for example, in 2014, there was you know, a big <coughs> bump on that. I think yeah. it might have to do with, you know, what. Um, we put the Sims money into the legal budget. Yeah. When we did it eight, nine years ago. So I, I, don't, I wasn't here for that, so I don't recall that. Yeah. I think what you're seeing in 2014 was a reserve fund transfer into the legal budget. So we didn't, we didn't bump up the budget request at the beginning of the budget season for expected costs. Yeah. We, we used the legal appropriation to pay it and then get a reserve fund transfer request. Again, it really doesn't, it's not an important question. I'm just wondering why this was split out as an article rather than. Uh, in the legal budget, because there have, it has been done in the past. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess in general, we, I, I try to never spike an appropriation in one year and have it go back down the next year. And I think this is a large enough issue for there to be a community dialogue independently about the expenditure. And it's probably more transparent this way, you know, yeah. because it's fairly clear what it's going to be. Okay, Charlie? <clears throat> if you think um, that the, uh, the 40B process has a 99.9% .9 history in favor of the 40B uh, going through. Why, why do you think it's a good idea to spend this money? I mean, this is your recommendation as opposed to somebody else's recommendation. So I think, a, a little bit contrary to what Tom said earlier, I think if we went right now to Oak Tree and said, look, let, let's talk, I think they would say, no, we have you beat. You, you, you can't stop us. And, it, and if we don't think you have any commitment to dragging this out and making us lose money based on the loss of time, you know, then, then we want to build our 219 units. 
But if we demonstrate that we have a commitment to, to putting them, to, to even more than putting them through their paces, then I think this is money well spent to show them that we're serious about the potential impacts of their current proposal on East Arlington. That can then get us to a point where when we're on the precipice of a much longer and protracted legal battle, that a negotiation would be more appetizing to them. That, uh, that's my, my thought on it. Thank you. Yeah, I think now you're addressing both, both, both Charlie and Tom. Even, even if we decided to sit down tomorrow with Newgar and say, rebate, let's negotiate mitigation, let's, let's negotiate putting the ACA there or something, I think that would also involve contracts and some technical support and additional legal. So I, I don't think the Warren article says this is money to fight it but this is money to support the negotiations, which sort of could go either way, I would think. Or is, if, if, if by the time the end of town meeting, everybody ruled against us and it's time to stop fighting, we probably do want to go to the developer and say, what can we get out of this? Can we get an arts center? Can we get a community center? Can we get something? That's going to involve some excess legal expenses and maybe some extra things we have, so. John? But just remember, at the end of the day, he doesn't have to give you anything. Right. So if you've aggravated him enough yeah. and you stalled it and you made him spend a lot of money, he does not have to give you anything. Yeah. If you be nice about it and you sit down, you'll probably get the most you're going to get right now out of him. Yeah. So if I can, uh, so this is long before my history, probably a lot of our histories. I mean, there's two players here, right? There's the landowner, there's the Mugo family, and then there's the, uh, the development entry. My understanding is this town aggravated the Mugo family a lot. <laughs> so, uh, I think that, that foundation has been laid. Uh, so it, it's really with Oak Tree. And, you know, so I, I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag in where we, where we stand. Okay, and y'all see. Yeah, and, and just one more card. I mean, we were early in the process here that. There are a number of things in the, the application that Oak Tree sent in for the project uh, eligibility letter, determination letter, that they haven't addressed that, that the town con considers to be woefully inadequate. So, you know, where we sit today, I think it is appropriate to ask for the money and see what they submit. But there was a number of areas related to floodplain and then just other issues, what maps they're using, that if they use the same information that they used earlier, I think their outside council believes that there, there may be some inroads we could make. And, and, and as to the batting average, I mean, you know, maybe we're just talking about the scope of the project at the end of the day, but it's, it's important to go through the process and at least be ready to respond to a comprehensive permit application a little later rather than talk about it's over, it's done, <coughs> let's, let's, let's see what we can do. So I mean, I think you look forward and, and, and see what information comes in. I think it's far too early to talk about winning and losing at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions on this article? Okay, article 39 is appropriation for public art. So this is, a, this is a continuation of the discussion we had last year about having a consultant to go through a process for uh, looking at what kind of public art people want in, in East Arlington as sort of a, a capstone to the Mass Ave Corridor project. At that point last year, there was a lot of talk about, you know, will this be for art or will this be for process? Last year it was for process, and the town hired a consultant, Cecily Miller, who's been going through that process. Um, this year, uh, or, or I should say, I should go back. Last year, um, I believe what I said was that, you know, I don't think the town should be the first towards contributing towards the purchase or fabrication or whatever the right term would be for the art, and that there would need to be, if any town funds were expended, I think there'd have to be a leveraging of private monies. And what Arlington Public Art, the uh, Vision 2020 subcommittee has actually done is they've raised $15,000 in the past year to put towards this purchase of public art. And what they've asked for is if the town would be willing to match that $15,000. So I, um, I think it would add to the vibrancy of East Arlington. Uh, I think that the project has come out wonderfully and this would be sort of a nice culmination to that. 
And I, I, I do think that it, it, there's a reasonableness and it shows you know, good faith on the part of town of matching the pretty significant effort that these folks have put forth in the past year to actually raise $15,000 in private funds. It's not, it's not a promise to the money's actually in the town's fund for public art uh, to be used for these purposes. So I know last year uh, we, we had a dialogue about whether or not I thought you know, tax dollars should be regularly spent on art and I don't think that given our overall financial picture that you know, we would ever want to do a 1% you know, for the arts type program via the capital budget or another budget. But I, I think on a, a piece by piece decision making basis, uh, that also looks again at what's coming from the community that this is a reasonable request. Questions, Carol? I know it's not hard, but I'm going to use it as an example. How much did the Robin, Friends of Robin's Farm raise to redo the slide, the large slide up there? I think they raised about 25000 about an equal amount. That's what I thought. Okay. So in this case, it's, what are the two amounts? It would be 15. 15, 15 1, 5, and 5, 0. No, no 1, 5, one five, five, 1, 5, one five, one five, one five, one five okay. Frank? Uh, interesting how this, when contrasting with the ATED asking for the website, and these people have you know, raised 15. But there's a different slant. Here are these. Who are the people who are donating this fifteen thousand? Are they the actual, you know, have uh, some sort of interest in the actual art that's being displayed? Or are they the so uh, the majority of the funds that were raised were through the, the program called uh, Cheerful We Set, mm -hmm. that annual event they do where they raise some chance to raise funds. Yeah. And I think there was uh, Art Rocks Monogamy two years ago, and then Art Rocks Spy Pond. Mm -hmm. uh, this past year, and those were the raised funds. And the, the culmination of a couple of years of Cheerful Leader Sit and those Art Rocks project raised those funds. So they were all, you know, sort of organized fundraisers. Okay, I guess. Them. So, how much influence would they have over the art that's decided? I guess it's sort of the. It's part of the rub with the website thing is if you let other people contribute money, then they influence on what's on the website. So they might, you know, oh, I donated this money, I want picture of the statue or something. So in this case, uh, how does that apply? Does it, is it, would it affect, would it, what effect do those donations have on the actual art? Is there any influence? So it, it should have no influence. Okay. Uh, other than we, uh, so we, we have this consultant, it's gonna go through a process, gonna issue an RFP for artists to come in and make proposals, and there'll be a panel of judges who will make a decision about which art we want to select for the various sites. And we'll probably want someone on that panel of judges who is from the arts community so they can help us non-artists understand what we're looking at and what might be appropriate. So there, there may be some overlap in terms of participation, but no direct expectation of what will be selected. Okay. Thank you. And then they have a budget of essentially, if this gets past, 30000 to buy. Right. Any art, and if not, they'd have fifteen thousand to buy Correct. any art. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are these um, temporary installations, like it's by bond, or are these like permanent installations? Like, what is going to be done? Like, do they expect? So, I, I I think that's somewhat of an open question based on what's proposed. So, you know. I almost fell off my chair when I, uh, chair when I first met with this consultant and said, oh, most communities, you know, you talk at $250,000 to $500,000 <laughs> for, you know, a nice permanent yeah. exhibit. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think we could have the expectation that there's going to be some 30-year piece of art that's made for this amount of money. But I hope that we can have the expectation that it's not a one-year okay. piece yeah. of art. But seeing what artists actually submit will help right. that out a little yeah. bit. Really? <laughs> Adam, is fifteen thousand that's been raised actually raised or simply promised? It's actually raised. So it's sitting somewhere. Okay. okay. Other questions, Carolyn. I'm going to use the Robin's Farm example again. How long is the slide supposed to last, approximately? Well, I got an email about the slide being broken last week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess the proper maintenance though that the slide should probably last about a year. Yeah. 
<laughs> about a year, <laughs> seven, ten years. Alan? Um, how, do you have a judgment of, of how a uh, appropriation of taxpayer dollars for public art might impact the outcome of a future override vote? To be candid, I think some people might be upset by it and other people would be invigorated by it. So maybe balanced? Yeah, I, and I, where that balance is, I, I, I don't know. Who, who did the, uh, the, there's been a couple of things in, in public art over the last few years, like for example, you know, if you look at Marathon Street, right at the corner of Mass Ave and Marathon at Anthony's Eastside Deli, that whole wall was done, beautiful painting job. Yeah, yeah. Where did that come from and who paid, who paid for it? So that was all private. And that's what that was. Stephanie Marlin Curiel, who serves on both the Cultural Council and the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, was sort of the lead of that. I'm forgetting, it, it was not through Arlington Public Art. But um, I guess I would just say it was, a, it was a community group that worked with the property owner and raised their own funds to, to do it. And how about all the uh, electrical boxes through Arlington Center that have been painted? So that has <coughs> been, um, that that's, is Arlington Public Art. And every year they do a call for um, basically, you know, someone to map out what they'll do on it. And then they pay out of the funds they've raised also from other programs. They'll pay then, you know, for uh, uh, supplies and materials and a little stipend for the artist who comes and uh, who comes and does it. Okay. Uh, Grant? Sort of like the uh, fine thread on the emperor's clothes. How much art does 15000 buy and how much art does 30000 buy? I mean, is that, how do we know we've, Gotten good art, you know, can we get enough good art for 15 minutes? Well, that's objective. <laughs> well, that's what that's I mean. The art is going to tell us, you know, good art. That's why you have a consultant who knows. Right. Yeah. How, Hopefully. How, what color the threads are, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I've tried to dig into this a little bit, and, you know, this art could be, um, you, you know how in the Porter Square escalator, has anybody been in there? Yeah. And, and there's those bronzed yeah. gloves. Um, you know, maybe that's a bad example, but you know, there could be something like that laid across or, or, or you know, the side of a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll last a long time. Or, 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 or the statues they have in Data Square, or the figures. Yeah, or, or a statue, or um, you know, a redesign of a, of a set of, of sidewalk panels. I, I guess it's pretty open as to, as to what it could be. I mean, I've tried to steer them away from paint on ground that will wash away and wear away and become blight very quickly. So I, I'm hoping that we can get something more durable. See, I guess that's what I mean. It's like, well, well how much does one of those statues cost? Is that 15 or is it 200,000? You know, what, what does that buy? Yeah. Yeah. Bronze, a bronze, bronze statue is more right. than, so more than 30,000. It's like, does it just give the, uh, is it even a sufficient, you know, it's hard to measure, you know, and what do other towns do? So I'm just wondering, what does it buy? Would it buy, I understand you're gearing it toward something more permanent, but, you know, one statue or something, but. Well, again, we've spent this more than this amount of money on a slide, and I, I understand that it helps lots of kids. But that's why I keep bringing up that example. Because how much did we, did the town, put in for the slide? So I, I, it was approximately right. twenty-five thousand. Right. We, we may have we're talking you know, put a little more, a little less. We're talking fifteen. Yeah, but those slides were fun. Yeah, they are, and I've used them. <laughs> Well, this might be an Altosti statue in the corner of Teal and, uh, and Mass Ave. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was a dark fear. Too. I don't know yeah. how many people remember this, but for years and years and years, at the bottom of the Boston Common, there was a statue about the warriors of the Polish army yeah, yeah. Uh, on horses. So yeah. it was a, a substantial piece. Yeah. And for years, a lot of people thought it was the ugliest thing they've ever seen. And different departments in Boston were fighting on who had to take it. And, and finally, the last time I saw it, it was on the bridge going over to the convention center. Uh, you know, probably wouldn't spend that kind of money, but. Uh, okay, are there, thanks so much for my little. Uh, are there any uh, other questions for the manager on this article? Okay. Um, <coughs> Okay, uh, we heard the other day the uh, Mount Gilboa transfer, and we just wondered if you had any comments on it. 
Yeah, so uh, bri briefly I'll say this is an idea of this uh, citizen uh, petition, but has been to some degree vetted with town council. And so you heard from Mr. Belskis, is that? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I, this actually ties right back in to the Mugar 40B issue. That if this was to go forward, transferring the conservation restriction from a piece of land on the top of Mount Cabo where the house sits, moving it onto the Great Meadows, and transferring ownership of that parcel where the home is to the housing authority would definitively put us over, without, most likely without argument, over that 1.5% threshold. Uh, so conceptually, it's a very good idea. In practicality, it's a more challenging idea. Uh, we've already started hearing from some uh, residents who live up in that neighborhood about you know, concerns about what the impact would be, and I think those are extremely valid concerns. Uh, today, the most I can say is that I've had a preliminary conversation with John Griffin at the Housing Authority, the Executive Director, and I guess they've long had an interest in the Mount Gilboa House, so I can talk more with him to figure out you know, if this was to happen, what his thoughts are, what there, would there be any neighborhood impacts, would he want to do something in the existing structure, which I think he would have to from historic standpoint anyways, so, um, you know, fear of impacts might be overstated, but having a clear path of what it would look like would be helpful for people to understand what the impacts would be. Okay, John, then Al. Yeah, Adam, I asked this question uh, the other day, and I just, what's the, the loss of rental income? How much does About that About 24,000 a year. And, um, just to follow up with that though, uh, how much, Regular maintenance would there be, and how much deferred maintenance is in that house? A lot of deferred mm -hmm. maintenance. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah. Uh, and there's been years where we've, you know, we, we actually probably haven't spent very much on it recently, but in years past, we've had to spend a lot on uh, some roofing issues, some gutter issues, some tree issues. So there, there, are, there are costs involved. And um, when you said that uh, the Housing Authority had long had an interest in that. In the building as it is, or as a as a site for putting up additional affordable housing. So my understanding was the building as it is, but I, I I'd like to get more clarity on that. Even with all the deferred maintenance. Yeah, but I I have to double check. I'm pretty sure the building's on the historic register, so I don't know that we could think so. do anything else. I, I think we'd have to live within that anyways. And uh, I guess the. the my other que the other question I had the other day was, um, <clears throat> so what the, are the restrictions in terms of if the town wanted to outright sell the property? And is that a feasible option or not? So we would still have to deal with this conservation issue because right now it is on a, con a piece of conservation land. So we could not sell it. I guess I think this through. So we, let, let's say we did this, but not transfer it to the housing authority and sold it. We would, that, in that case, we wouldn't be doing anything to benefit the one and a half percent calculation. And you know, people might say that that's not what we want to do, but we should try to attempt to sell it anyways. And I think that's a worthwhile discussion to have as well. I, I, I guess the question is, how much do we want to? Um, pay, effectively pay to put the icing on the one and a half percent cake because we've already had the ZBA announcing that we've met the one and a half percent. My understanding from the presentation last meeting was that this was a way to kind of give us a little added security yes. in terms of meeting that number. But no, no guarantee because the state could still say we disagree. Correct. I think I tried to push selling that house several years ago, and we looked into Bob, I can't remember who did this, into the grant that allowed us to buy the thing, and it, it, I think it would be a violation of the terms of the grant, because you can't separate out the house, you know, in other words, it was bought as one parcel, and you couldn't separate out the house and sell it, and so we couldn't do it. So I don't think you can. Uh, Alan, can you have a I question? Just reflecting the, the concerns I've heard from the neighbors, they, would, they are concerned that if the transfer would take place, and the house would come down and 20 units of residential housing would go up. Um, is there any, are there were any restrictions on the existing agreements or you know, bequest um, or, or any 
restrictions that could be written into the transfer to prevent that, to, to reassure the neighbors that that could never happen. Yeah, you could probably start with zoning. And I would, I would hope that what we're not doing here is opening up the door for another 40B application to, uh, <laughs> to put in 20 units up there. So, you know, I, I think that bears further review by Doug. Grant, oh, sorry, Charlie and then Grant. So, I remember when we walked that property. That was about uh, probably 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, I think the town spent $500,000 to acquire wow. that property. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah. And, and uh, there was a tremendously uh, series of, uh, I'll call them eloquent or charismatic presentations, at the town meeting about the value, the historic value of this property and the conservation value of the property. Um, are we abandoning that? I mean, what's, what are we really doing here? Yeah, I mean, I... An open space, the open space. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the, the spirit of it, as I understand it, is to, you know, it, at least it puts a permanent conservation restriction on the Great Meadows. No, the ar a totally fair argument is that's not even in Arlington. And you're removing that conservation benefit from the neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I would say, well, I guess I'd definitely say, I mean, it is the citizen filed article. I see the benefits strictly from the Mugar point of view, but in terms of neighborhood impacts and loss of conservation land, it's, it has to be weighed as to whether or not the town wants to do it. Just to clarify that though, are we talking about transferring the house, the garage, and the land right around it? Or are we talking about transferring the whole thing? <coughs> Just the parcel that the house is on. So the rest of it would stay so indivisible? It, it, it already is. It's already divided. Yeah. Okay. Um, Grant, and then David. So we're saying 20,000, 24,000 in, in revenue. That's gross. It doesn't account for repairs and all the deferred maintenance, right? Just to be clear. Yes, yes. It's not netting. It's, it's not clearing. Okay. David? And isn't that house part of the um, historical district up there? I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's it is. all historical district. There's all kinds of limitations on, on present limitations on what you can do with it and what you can't can't do. With it. Okay. Are there any, John? I I, mean, I don't know if we know the answer to this, but does if the Arlington Housing Authority owns the property, are they subject to those same hmm. restrictions? I, I don't know. Historic restrictions. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they would. I think they have. Okay, are there any other questions on the Mount Joe Wall property? And then the last one was, if I keep remembering to close my eye. Um, oh, the easement removal, Article 29. Um, we have a hearing scheduled for it, but my understanding is uh, that there's a process that you go through. I was wondering if you could. Uh, explain the process of determining the uh, the value of the easement and how much it will cost, how much we will get to remove it. Yes, absolutely. So there was a, a very similar question, and not even very similar, the exact same question uh, about Venner Road um, two years ago? Yeah, yeah. Is that two years ago. Um, and the, the issue very quickly is, not a full easement, but what's called exterior lines running through for the most part, the property that town meeting dealt with two years ago, but a little triangle of it on this property. And two years ago, I ran a calculation of what the reduced amount of tax revenue was that the town had received over the years because that property um, in the other, the other person, <coughs> that property was actually taxed at a different rate because it was non-buildable because the lines ran through there. So I ran a calculation of what we would have collected in taxes uh, if it had been buildable. And then also, I just inflated what the original easement or the taking price was that the town paid for it and inflated that up to, at, at that point, $2,014. So that came to a total of $65,000 that uh, the owner of that whole parcel paid to the town to release the lines 
They subdivided it, and there's two giant homes um, down there now. This would basically allow the same thing. There's one home on the parcel on Pleasant View, but the parcel runs down to the corner of Venner, and by releasing the small exterior lines, they most likely, I'm not positive of this, but they'd be able to put two homes uh, on the land. So what I plan to do is run that same calculation. <clears throat> It'll be a much smaller number based on the much smaller square footage and offer that for town meetings consideration and, and to the owner for consideration. And there's obviously no, we don't need these easements anymore. I, I would say d definitively after we gave up the one two years ago, it's certainly of no use to us. Okay, are there any other questions? Are there questions of the manager on this issue? Okay, um, while well, we got him here, are there any other questions? for the manager in general. Status of the town, snow's going away. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, you want to vote. You don't mind. Okay. Speak of the devil. <clears throat> so uh, what, what's coming around is uh, a vote that we've used now for the past two years we're about a finance committee who authorized us to deficit spend for snow and ice. Uh, we provided a memo uh, that I believe the chairman circulated last week. At that point, the estimate total was uh, $727,000. Since then, a further SALT invoice has come in the amount of uh, approximately $60,000. And then we had that snow icy event uh, on, a, on a Monday to Tuesday. So um, we're still under the $846,000 appropriation, but with another event, we're more than likely going to go over that number. So what's before you is a request to authorize up to $250,000 in additional spending for, um, for snow and ice. I, I think this might be the first year we'd actually get it to you before we did go over that upset limit. Um, and I, and I you know, knock on wood, we won't spend this much, but while I was here, I figured we would try to get this done and have the appropriate authorization. For the new people, the, uh, the Snow and Ice budget is the only budget in town that can be legally overspent with the approval of the Finance Committee and the selectmen. Do I remember correctly or just the Finance just Committee? Just the Finance Committee. Okay. So um, uh, they basically, unless we approve this, they can't spend more than their budget is. Um, and he'd probably give out our phone numbers. <laughs> 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 I move favorable action. Second. Okay, moved and seconded for favorable action on the motion. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay, all those in, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, 15 to zero. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, are there any other questions for the manager? Kurt, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, while all this stuff is so fresh in our minds, why don't we go through, I'm trying to close one eye and go through the other one is just not worth it. Okay, let's go back. Let's do these in order that we heard. Article um, 28 is the... Uh, community aggregation issue. Uh, the manager said there's no financial impact on the town uh, per se uh, because the town goes out to bid separately. Um, could be some small management issues with phone calls at the beginning. Um, I guess I'd recommend just let the selectmen handle this and, but I hear a lot of, I see a lot of nodding heads. Charlie? I just have, serious concern about how this can not have some cost to the town if the town gets involved in <coughs> managing electric power to every every house in the community. I mean, it's not, it, they're selecting the vendor, there's issues of quality control. Um, there, there's got to be some cost here. Anybody else? Okay, do I, anybody want to make a motion uh, to let the selectmen handle it or to do whatever else they want to do? 
What do you want to do? So move. Move to? Let the selectman handle it. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor of letting the selectman handle it, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. So, selectman article. Uh, I don't know if this has been heard by the selectman yet, but um, I would suggest anybody who has concerns to bring them to the, uh, bring them to the selectman. Okay, so uh, Article 38 is the, uh, okay, so this is a request for $25,000 uh, for legal assistance to help with the, the ZBA when they receive the uh, UGAR um, application. What is the will of the committee? Move to 25. Is there, is there a second? <coughs> okay. So it's moved and uh, seconded for $25,000. Is there any discussion? Okay, Charlie and then Dean. I think that, um, you know, I think by voting this money, we're supporting the town going in an entirely wrong direction. I mean, we're, I mean, it, it, this is a this is a tip of the iceberg. There's a there's a big uh, amplification of the spending at the other end. And um, I mean, he said it in his own words. I mean, he basically said that the, the, the chance of us succeeding at opposing this uh, 40B is less than one percent. And yet, uh, I I mean, I think. Uh, I think Alan or somebody mentioned that, well, this could be, this money could be spent for, uh, let me use the term, non-oppositional efforts by the town. But I don't think that's the intention of the town manager or the town council or any of the boards. So um, here we are discussing, you know, all the tax impacts we're going to have coming up in the next several years and the school enrollment problem, you know, all, all sorts of different financial demands. And we're, we're, we're sort of blessing the town going out in this uh, uh, litigation venture uh, and something that is just, in my, in my opinion, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to end up in, a, in, in uh, the, the town not getting anything out of it. And somebody should be telling the town, and maybe it is the finance committee, telling the town uh, uh, management, including the board of selectmen, that just spending money willy-nilly on, on legal adventures to take a political position to make people, certain people happy is just the wrong thing to do when we have a lot of demands on, on the town. And, and um, I agree that the, that the um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of this 40B that are not palatable. And I, I'm not in favor of, you know, dramatically increasing the population in East Arlington or what the impacts might be on the schools. Those are, those are all negative aspects. But spending money on lawyers is not talking to the developer or the owner and trying to get a different outcome. And as Tom said earlier, you know, we'll fight and we'll fight and we'll fight and by the time somebody wakes up and says, well, we should do something different, they're not gonna care that they've already sunk money into it. I, I just think we're going down the wrong path here and I don't think the finance committee in my opinion, my humble opinion, you didn't know I had a humble opinion. <laughs> but in my humble opinion, I don't think the Finance Committee should endorse that. Mary Margaret? Uh, but I also feel like we have a financial obligation to the people who live there and whose homes will be impacted by flooding. And they are part of the town, and I think we need to at least try to support them. And I think there's still some opportunity here. I don't think we're throwing the money away. And I don't think it'd be, I mean, it's, it's all part of our town and the nature of the town and the reason people want to live here. And then to just ignore a whole portion of our town. I mean, it's not just a political thing. It's their property values and what's going to happen to their houses. John? Yeah, I mean, Charlie, I, I agree with you and the town manager's assessment that if this were to go to litigation and be fully litigated, 
our odds are not very good. But another way to think of this is you're spending money to create litigation risk for the other side to bring them to the table to try and, and reach a, a, a settlement and avoid the costs of fully litigating this this battle. <coughs> Dean? So, so I'd say three things, and I'd start by saying I, I fully support what, what Charlie says. So um, before I moved to Arlington, I lived in Belmont, and we had this discussion. We said, look, we're going to sue O'Neill because he's going to come to the table when we sue him. Okay, so there's a giant 40B going up across the highway for a bunch of people with this argument. And what that leads me to say is that the second thing, which is I, I get very frustrated in, in, in government when we have these counterintuitive arguments, right? So in, in my private life, when we get sued, we don't get happy and think, oh, let's negotiate. And then we spend a bunch of money on lawyers and we start to get the advantage and we start to win. And then we say, you know what? You know what? We've got the town by, we've got the town where we want them. We can get one, you know what? Let's sit down and cut a deal. Because we've, and that's what happened again over in Belmont, is they said, let's go fight O'Neill to the death. He incurred all this cost. He incurred all this money. He got the 40B permit. And then the town ran in and said, no, no, no. Let's sit down and negotiate. And you can spend more money negotiating with us. That, that's, that's, that's an absurd argument that we try to float here. That, that, that doesn't, it doesn't pass any muster. And, and you know what, the, the, the third problem I have is if the town had a good record of this stuff, I'd believe it, right? I moved to this town and I was told this. When I moved here, I was told, look, we're gonna buy the Sims. We're gonna develop it in like three years, flip it and it's gonna be great. And that was a disaster. That was, and it was funny because but Christine was talking about litigation that went wrong. I first thought you were talking about the Sims because it was a debacle. But then I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We couldn't manage risk at the school department either because don't worry, we're going to terminate two employees. No big deal. No money, no problem. And again, that became a disaster. And I remember what, what, what happened in both the locations is they came to the finance committee and said, don't worry, just throw us a little bit of money, 25 grand. We're going to make it go away. We're going to make it go away. It didn't go away. It turned into disaster after disaster after disaster. And then we had the, the field thing, of course, where like the turf field is now, it was like bubbling up. And, you know, I, I don't, again, again, I remember we even had executive session for that, right? We had an executive session at the finance committee. No big deal. John Marr told us we were going to bring the parties to the table and give me this hundred grand. And boom, all was going to be cured. And then we just replaced a turf field that was a disaster. So. It, it, it just, you can't look at the record that Belmont had where they failed with this strategy. You can't look at this town whose elected leadership can't manage these problems and say that this is going to have a different result. That's, it, it's insane. And, and I agree with Charlie, which is we are green lighting insanity at this point. We're, we're green lighting them to say, let's gear up for war and let's spend a lot of money and at the end of the day, I, I think what it does is it allows a, a, a vocal constituency, constituency in town who's always wanted this property to feel like they fought the fight. And it allows the, the hope for the people of East Arlington or that neighborhood who I feel really, really bad for to think that they can win this when Adam said they can't win this. So I, I just don't, I can't, I can't sort of sponsor this, this degree of recklessness based on everything we've done in the past. Uh, Carolyn, um, okay, I'm going to do it. I move that we table this until the town manager can devise a more narrow use of the twenty-five thousand dollars that is currently in this warrant article. Because I heard two things. I heard him say using the money for some technical consulting and some early phase, they haven't even submitted their report yet. I'll second it. Uh, um, a ZBA, um, they haven't even submitted to the ZBA. So they're talking about some legal consulting fees around what the ZBA um, obtains from the oak, is it oak tree? Oak tree, yeah. oak tree um, developer. 
and then um, maybe some consultation between them and there was another Massachusetts group that was involved, or a state level group that was involved. Wasn't there? No. I don't know. Um, so that, that they narrowed this particular um, appropriation. Because the way it's written, it, it sort of, you're right, it does sort of drag out. And is there a way to narrow it to the first two phases of the application process? Well, 25,000 would, of it, in and of itself, well, it wouldn't be limited to next year because it is a uh, Warren article, but it's obviously limited to 25,000. I think he said about 5,000 for technical, uh, uh, maybe engineering support, and the, the rest for legal. Except that the way the article is written, it can travel, it can turn into this whole big snowball, which is what Charlie and Dean are both concerned about. So what I'm wondering, is there a way to word the article so that it doesn't allow for that? So they have to come back again for another warrant article if they're going to take the process further. Well, they would have to come back again. I mean, it's only 25000 yeah, but we're taking, I'd rather it not be down this slippery slope path. I'd rather narrow the length of the slope. Okay. Stephen, do you yeah. have? Yeah, well, I, I seconded Dick's um, motion for favorable, favorable action here. And even if the town wasn't going to oppose the comprehensive permit application, there's probably $25,000 worth of fees to assess the comprehensive permit to hire our experts to, to, to continue with the, um, with the lawyers. Now, I, this, this is in my precinct. I'm in precinct two, so I have an obligation to people in, in, in my neighborhood as well as the town. But what I heard from town meeting last year and what I heard from the meetings is that the town doesn't want this. Our legislative delegation doesn't want this. So it's, I don't think it's, it's, it, it's just narrow to the people on Dorothy Road and on Little John Road and, and, and in that area. And respectfully, Dean, this is much different than the Belmont Uplands in terms of access, in terms of wetlands issues, in terms of what's going on there. So to compare what happened with O'Neill and Belmont to what's happening here, where there have been multiple attempts over the years to develop something and, and nothing has happened. It's, it's, it's apples and bananas. And, and the only thing that is in common is that, yes, it is housing that's being proposed. But to, to are we going to micromanage our legal department now and, and our manager and say, no, we, we're not going to give you this money? I think. I think it's the next phase maybe that you look into, okay, how much is this going to cost? But right now, there are a number of issues that were identified with the initial project eligibility letter. <coughs> the uh, Oak Tree people haven't responded to a number of, of questions and concerns that there, there's issues of whether they're using the wrong flood map. There's, there's a whole number of questions. And unfortunately, the money's going to be needed through this town meeting before we may have some of those answers. I say, give the town the money, let them do their job, at least in the first phase, and, and, and see what happens. And, and I think Adam probably could have chosen a better choice of words in terms of winning and losing, because again, a lot of these 40B type challenges, even when everything is exhausted, you talk about the scope of, of the project. And I think there's a lot of people that would say, um, if you just put townhomes on Dorothy Road, for example, there probably wouldn't be opposition to that outside of the neighborhood, but it's, it's because of the 200 units behind. There's some real <coughs> questions on that and, and significant questions. And, and I think, you know, I feel like I owe it to the people who live in Precinct 2, but I also think that we owe it to the people who, who are, are managing our legal budget to say we need this $25,000 right now to look at it. We're all commenting on something that we don't even know what the comprehensive permit looks like right now because it's not even in. And we're saying, no, let's not give them the money. Um, I think it's too premature, and I don't think we should shut the door at this stage. I think you'll look later on to see what, uh, see what is going on. But I don't think that's our job to, to, to shut it off right now. Okay. Other people. Grant. And it must be a micromanaging evening or something like that because everything we've come across so far, we've been saying the same thing. The website, how are they going to? We want detail and how are they going to do that? And, the, and here we and, and our, kind of, I'd like to feel more comfortable if we. So I'm inclined to uh, agree with um, with Charlie 
Dean's position or would be more objective to not supporting that if I did have an itemization. Just some idea of like, well, the only saving grace is that they don't use it, I guess it goes back, but, but what are we buying with? You know, what, just an example, like, well, does it, in fact, if you saw this, I right, well, here's 7.5 for environmental study, and here's, I mean, I understand it's pretty easy that you can go real fast, but, but some sort of itemization about what it might go for instead of a sort of a blank check would help me, you know, be more objective. It still might be micromanaging it, that's a very good point, but it would help me be more objective about it. Alan? Uh, I guess this is a question for, for Charlie and Dean. If we, uh, if FinCon takes a vote to um, recommend no action, would you think that we'd want to go further and say no action because we think it's time to stop and be very explicit about that? Would that be appropriate in the recommendation from FinCon? Time to stop what? Time, time to stop. Say, say throw in the towel and start negotiating. For the best well, possible. Negotiating is not throwing in the towel. Well, I, okay. I mean, I, Stop I, I'm, well, not, I, I'm not in favor of throwing in the towel. I'm in favor of not taking a totally 100% antagonistic view, which is what everybody, you know, the, the selectmen, the town manager, <coughs> everybody says they're going to do to quote unquote stop Bugar, right? And that's not going to stop Bugar. I, I, I guess the question <laughs> should do you think it would be appropriate for the finance committee to take a position that was more explicit than just no action? Uh, that's up to the finance committee. It wouldn't bother me. I mean, I well, would I was certainly asking support it. You and Dean specifically, yeah. if you thought it would be appropriate yeah, to I mean, if, if take it, a more explicit position. If it made sense, it would be helpful, sure. There, there's, uh, I, I think Dean's, tell me a true sense in, I think Dean's comments to a certain degree uh, were, were valid over in Belmont. Um, Belmont has some differences. There were no neighbors of Belmont near that construction site. Uh, and I'm not sure, but I don't think Belmont was near 10% affordable housing or 1.5% of land area. I, I, I think the big issue here is the 1.5% of land area because it's not just this, it's all the other, you know, other projects that, that somebody could uh, develop uh, and ignore our local zoning. And uh, it, at least it seems here we might have a chance uh, of, of reaching the one and a half percent. Maybe it needs Mount Gilboa, maybe it needs one or two other things. But uh, ZBA has already declared that we're at one and a half percent over another project. Uh, it, it seems to me we should give the town manager and the legal department the resources to see to make sure if we're near there that we can have the best argument possible to get there. And then if we're at one and a half percent, then we really negotiate from a position of strength uh, on that. So I, I, I think the twenty-five thousand dollars would be a, a, a legitimate use um, to to try to reach that goal if at all possible. So my two cents. Anybody else? Alan? Just a technical question. If, if this was not appropriate in the Warren article, would it be appropriate if the, if the amount was needed in August for the town manager to come and ask for a transfer from the reserve fund for not, over $25,000? Well, would that be an alternative way of funding it? No, yeah, I mean, if the Warren article. flushes out at 630. You know, if a Warren article is, is defeated on the town meeting floor, I think it would be. Uh, uh, there would have to be something really strong for finance committee in effect to reverse the decision of, of town meeting. So basically this is, you know, he could have just put it in the legal budget mm -hmm. and, and just slipped it through that way. Instead, there's an article before, so everybody knows what it is. We discuss it and decide. Finance committee, uh, town meeting discusses it and decides and then goes from there. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, I, it's an open, transparent way to deal with the issue. Okay, uh, other people, Tom and then Christine. I, I think it's important we understand though, the Finance Committee um, uh, agrees or votes for this $25,000 that it, it's, there's no end to the dollar amount at the end. There's no end. It's not 25, it's not 50, it's not 100, whatever it might be. So I, I, I agree with Charlie, I, I, I think we should just <clears throat> nip it for now,
because it's going to be way more than 25 just gets you into a, a attorney's office. That's, that's all it's going to get you. It's, it's just not an end to the stop. Christine? This may be a, a transparent uh, move, or it could be a shot across the bow. Um, and I'm not quite sure which it is. Um, I don't know why it's not in uh, the legal department budget. Um, I am concerned for all the reasons that Charlie says and Dean says that this is the this is the beginning of the slippery slope, and we have not proven ourselves to be very good at controlling these type of uh, things. Um, I'm struggling with whether um, I'm struggling with, with our what is our role. It, it, this is very to me. It's a fine line between uh, a financial policy de decision and a political decision. And um, I'm concerned about the, the project and I'm concerned about the, the uh, effect of it. On the other hand, I've lived in this town for 55 years and there's been flooding in that area of the town for 55 years, so we haven't been doing anything to help that. Maybe this is a way to finally help that situation. I, I don't know, that's, that's you know, my capability. But I'm gravely concerned that, uh, that We'll look back at, at this as the first step and something that may be unpleasant for us. Mm. Okay, Carolyn and then John. Um, <laughs> so, so again, um, you know, I, I also live in this area. I'm, for, I'm closer to Mass Ave. I'm higher up uh, on the plain, but this is the area where I live, and and there has been flooding all along. And my concern as someone who's also considering buying in those areas or not buying in those areas, is that um, we, we really need to approach between now and once the filing is complete with the ZBA and or the state, that we, we have the resources we need to look at the information from a technical perspective and to look at the information from a scope perspective. And from my point of view, the 25,000 allows for that. I'm concerned that the warrant article allows for more than that. Um, as, as someone who thinks we should be um, on some level representing the people of that section of town, anyone who lives surrounding Thorndike Field, Magnolia Field, along Alwife Brook Park, uh, Alwife Brook um, is going to be affected, is potentially going to be affected by this. And to not put any money into the effort of scope and in the early phases through with the ZBA, I think <coughs> is crazy. Um, but I am concerned about lengthy drawing out of expenses down the road. The, um, we can draft the motion any way we want. So it doesn't really matter what the war article says. We can draft it the way we want, and you're in danger of being allocated that task if this passes. So, John, um, we, we, I've heard a lot about the slippery slope. I guess my question is, is, how does it become a slippery slope in terms of the financing mechanism? If we appropriate twenty-five thousand dollars, and twenty-five thousand dollars is spent, however it is spent. How, how does it then become a slippery slope? Presumably, they'd have to come back to finance committee and town meeting to appropriate more money. And it seems to me at that point, you have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to say yay or nay based on our feelings as to whether it's turning into a slippery slope. Is okay, that, is, is there anybody? I, I guess the question is, is, is that a, a reasonable characterization of how the process would work? Or is there another mechanism for, for, no, the, they, for the spending? Money either has to be uh, appropriated by town meeting or transferred from the reserve fund by the finance committee. They have, uh, or whatever money they have allocated in their legal budget, they could use that. But yes, they have to come back. Okay, any other? Okay, motion has been made and seconded for $25,000 uh, 
for what's described here uh, for technical and legal support uh, for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the manager. Yeah, but, the, but then I also moved to table, and so unless we ch to change the wording. I, I move that we um, approve $25,000 for a um, more limited uh, scope, um, for use of it in a more limited scope in the way that Carolyn has described. Okay. Um, Second. Okay, so, okay, so are you making that? <laughs> uh, what, Carolyn, Can did I you get a second to your motion to I table? Did, I did. I did. Yes. She did. Okay. Well, we. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can we handle one thing at a time. The first one is uh, the motion by uh, Carolyn to table action on this article. Can I take a friendly amendment? I'm sorry. Can I take a friendly amendment? Well, I think I just whispered. You know, we can only have one, <laughs> we can only have so many amendments. You made a motion to table. Okay. So, Second. all those in favor of tabling this article to a future date. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 Okay. We're back to the original motion. Uh, and uh, if it passes, I will work with Carolyn or whoever else is interested to uh, uh, to come up with wording that, that seems satisfying and then bring it back to the committee. So you'll have a shot on the wording too. Okay. All those in favor of the motion of $25,000 appropriation uh, under this article, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. <coughs> no. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven. All opposed? One, two, three, four. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, it's on 11 to 4. 11 to 4. So, I'll work on the motion and touch bases, the actual wording, and also um, work on the comment, uh, which, which hopefully can reflect some of the issues brought up at, the, uh, at this meeting. Okay, so that is favorable action on that. Okay, the next article, Appropriation for Public Art, request is 15000 Now, be before we start the discussion, I wanted to read last year's motion. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Now, about. please, this is... <laughs> Somebody else could read it. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay, I think I could do it. That the sum of 12000 being hereby is appropriated for the purpose of funding facilitation of a process to select and place public art at multiple locations in East Arlington, said some could be raised by general tax, et cetera. Now, that was a 13 to 5 vote of the FinCom. Comment. These funds will be used to assist with the public art selection process for projects along Mass Ave Quarter between Grafton and Cleveland Streets. It is anticipated, that leaves out my statue at Teal Street. No well. Uh, <laughs> It is anticipated that funds for the actual construction and maintenance will be priced, pr raised privately. So, just wanted to let you know that's what we said last year. And what was the and total amount? Twelve thousand. Twelve thousand, but that was to create the process and get right, the whole right. thing going. Right. And we basically said that the actual raising of money to actually construct the artwork will be done privately. So, okay, so this seems to. So, I, I just wanted to read that and make sure you had that before you. Second. Okay, moved and seconded for no action. Discussion. Charlie? Um, I, I would remind people as a sort of a prototypical example that um, about three weeks ago there was a fuss in the newspaper because the president of Iran was visiting Rome and they covered, <laughs> covered up all these nude statues. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, people were complaining that, uh, uh, you know, that these statues were a thousand years old and they were the world's greatest art. But to somebody else, they weren't art. It was pornography. And I'm not taking sides in that particular argument. I'm just saying that, you know, one person's art can be another person's pornography. And um, I, I think 
again, in the things that we have before us that are important for the public good. And I'm thinking about this, the, you know, we, I should say that our, our chairman made a very strong and, and clear stand to constrain school spending, uh, to, to try to, you know, keep spending within some budget limitations. I don't think we should be spending fifteen thousand uh, dollars on somebody's conception of art. I think the idea that this art gets funded privately is wonderful, but I don't think it should be done with town money. You know, I was thinking now of the, uh, the the picture on the East Side Deli in Arlington on Marathon Street, because it has back in Greece the marathoners and modern, and of course the modern people were all fully dressed. But they actually put pants on the Greek runners. <laughs> I guess they decided really being authentic was going too far from Marathon Street. Uh, okay, other discussion. Carolyn. Again, we spent twenty-five thousand dollars on a slide for the heights, and the and money was raised by private citizens in that area so that they could have the slide but the town chipped in 25 to match them. We're only talking about 15 here. I agree with Charlie's point, but I am gonna keep using that as an example. Can I amplify something? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, the town actually spent, uh, I think, 75 or $100,000 on the slide. We, we paid for the original, the town right. paid for the original, the original slide, slide. Right. and it was destroyed. Yeah. And so the Capital Planning Committee said, we're not gonna pay for the full replacement of the slide, local people have to put some, have to have some skin in the game. Right. So, um, I, I mean, it, that's a public purpose of, you know, recreation for the children, I think. It's a different case. Okay. I think that public art is a great thing. I think um, it brings the community together. I think they enjoy it, <laughs> um, at least where I live um, in East Arlington at Spy Pond. Uh, they had an installation last year, and people came to see that. Mm -hmm. I think that's good for our community, brings people in. And I also think that a sum of $15,000, especially when it's been um, uh, private citizens have added that, is pretty minimal, and I think it would be good for our community. David? Surprisingly, I, I would say that, excluding the bike path, that the slide of the Robin's Thumb is probably the largest tourist attraction we have in the town. Money well spent. Sorry, literally, people come from Vermont and New Hampshire to use that slide. Okay, motion has been made for uh, and seconded for no action on Article 39. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of no action, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay. All those in favor of no action, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All uh, opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so the motion of no action passes nine to six. I just want to say for the record, I did grow up at Robin's Farm. So. <laughs> <laughs> did you like this slide? <laughs> 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 it was a fine park back in the day. It was a fine park back in the day. It's very artistic. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, uh, article... 30. Now, Article 29 and Article 30. Um, there's no money involved in this. Uh, the removal of the easements could net us some money, which will go back into the general fund. Um, you heard the uh, manager's explanations. So, um, I guess I would suggest uh, we just have take, well, we could let the selectmen hear Article 29 and 30. 
uh, and handle it or we can take a position. So let's take Article 29 first. That's the easement, removal of easement restrictions. Uh, Dean. I don't think we took a, I think we ended up punting Venner Road back to the selectmen, right? I'm sorry? I think we punted Venner Road back to the selectmen yeah. a few years back. But I don't know if, I mean, if we're, at that point we took a precedent not to do these. Yeah. So I don't know well, if there, there's, does. there's no appropriation, you know, therefore they're not going to look to us for a recommendation. They'll look to the selectmen. So, uh, you want to let the selectmen hear, hear it and make a recommendation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, Gloria, can you call them back and tell them we don't need to hear? We don't need them for here. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Mount Gilboa, um, obviously there's some rental income of 24000 a year. The manager said there's a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, so do we want to, well, I guess we have two things. We could just let the selectmen handle the issue, or we could wait till we hear the selectmen's vote and decide if we want to do anything. Does anybody have any strong feelings one way or the other? I'd like to see the selectmen handle it. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Just let the selectmen handle it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So Article 30 is a selectmen vote. So I've been doing this for quite a while. I've never had, I don't, finance committee's never had so many split votes on one night uh, for, for quite a while. So I guess, okay, so. That means we're all thinking. Uh, yep, that's everything. Now, it is 941. Uh, does anybody have any budgets? Yeah. Okay, budget time. What budgets do you have? CBA. Okay. Library. Health and Human Services. <laughs> okay, Zoning Board of Appeals, 80, well, 91. Okay, on page 92 is the uh, salary pay. that there's a very large increase for this person, this part-time person, uh, requested for FY17. And <clears throat> this was a grade three, step three position, FY16. It's can jump to a six because there was an open position in the uh, Board of Selectmen office. This person uh, <coughs> applied for that position. That was a grade three, step five position. She was taking, she, <coughs> so she has that position. She's now full-time and part-time here. Um, <coughs> And next year she'll be step six. So that explains the the step recommended as as uh, printed. Okay, I, I'm so so the seventeen nine twelve was her base pay for last year. Yeah, that was you know forty. So it's eighteen. Forty nine percent of the full time. So it's a three thousand dollar increase, approximately. Well, they got to add the 998, so it's a 2,000 increase. Couple, you know, it's, it's 2,000. Steps plus 18 to 21. 2%. Okay, 3,000. 3, 3,000 dollar increase. 18, that one and that's the you'd rate. have two cost of living increases, so that'd be a 4%. Well, anyway, this is what the step plan has for that, uh, what the pay plan has for grade three, step six. Mm -hmm. It 
still it's still significantly less than half of the max. This is the other thing to notice. What's that? If this person was a full time staff member, their max salary would be forty six. Yes, that's right. And and here she's only forty one and a half. So she's still she or he is still below the significantly below the max. Well, that doesn't. <coughs> she, she, She's paid from two different budgets. Right. So she'll, she'll be at max. Total. So she's both a full time and a part time. She, she, has, she, two, has, she has two part time jobs part -time that job. add up to full time. Oh, okay. Last year she had one part time job here. So if you add the uh, the end total to this plus the selectman, you'll have one full you'll be one full time job in the paper. That's right. Yeah. If you take the full time number and run it and multiply it by 0.49, you get two zero nine six six nine nine six. That's with the step. That's with the step. Yeah. Oh, this match is higher. So are you recommending bottom the? Uh, we can go back well, to why, why don't you continue the presentation? So we go back to the, uh, the, the page that has everything on it. And, uh, and you see, um, you may be somewhat concerned about the, the budgets being high, but this is ZBA and we've been talking about what they're involved in. Probably not too high. Recent years, they have not been particularly involved in things as I understand. Okay, any questions? How come they don't spend any office supplies? <laughs> <laughs> they use the selectments. She takes notes on the paper. They, they, probably leave, they probably leave it in the advertising. <clears throat> Just a, a technical thing. In, in the uh, um, ZBA, it's a 3.6, and in the Selectman's Office, it's a 3.7. Is that kosher? What's this now? Level, level three, uh, grade 3, step 7 in the um, Selectman's Office, and level 3, step 6 in the ZBA. Is that? And it should the be the same in both places. Okay, so no. one of them's a typo. Did you look the check so is it a 3.6 or a 3.7? No, one of them is screwed up. Now. I don't think it's this one. Where, where are we looking? I was looking at the Selectman's Office and the ZBA. I assume it's the same person. That's the 0.49. 0.51 in the Selectman's Office, 0.49 in the ZBA. Where are you talking Are you talking about the percentage or the... You know, 20, no, the, the grade and step. In, in the ZBA, it's grade 3, step 6. If I'm reading it right. Yeah. And the selectman's office, it's grade three, step seven. Right? Yes. And based on what you had said, it should be six. It went from five to six. Isn't that what you had said yeah. earlier? And then the 46123 seems right. I think it just might be a typo and a step in the selectman's office. Okay. I talked to Karen about it today, so I, I told you what she told me. It's probably the same thing. Because the numbers work. I mean, the pay. Maybe. Sugar, I think. But she went from she went from part time to full time? Yeah. Or she's always been full time. Yeah, 4620. So she was part time. We can see what the amount of that is. Full time. That's what I was trying to get out of another one that had three. I'm seven. just wondering if she was part time at six and then full time at seven. Yeah, but I don't know if they can be mixed. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, do I have a motion? I move favorable action. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded for favorable action on 25 862. 
Uh, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? 217. Okay, Peter, uh, David? Uh, Peter and I have had planned to uh, submit the uh, selectman's budget and the manager's budget, but um, due to circumstances that there's going to be an adjustment in the manager's budget, uh, <laughs> including a salary adjustment and um, a renegotiated contract with the manager and also a new position that, that has been created. So we'll, we, we have to wait until the uh, comptroller comes back. The comptroller is going to wait and be back. Uh, I believe February 22nd. And that also uh, involves the selectman's uh, budget. Uh, we have some questions on the um, cost of the elections, the upcoming elections. And uh, we also have a question on what step it is on the that position that we just talked about. So uh, we have, I have to wait for the control to come back. So uh, Marie's supposed to get a, uh, get a hold of me as soon as he's back. And we'll set up a, a Okay, that's fine. Are there any other budgets? Yeah, we could do the veterans budget. That should be easy. Okay. That's page 153 under Health and Human Services. Okay, so I think what's obvious is the uh, <coughs> change in expenses has gone up an, another $15,000, um, which is because of an increase, it, what did you say, the increases in the families in need and that there are younger and younger vets seeking assistance that are between jobs and need assistance. And that actually Jeff has been, who manages that, has been going above and beyond in trying to find <coughs> these people jobs which isn't necessarily his role. I mean, he's supposed to help them access the different um, services that are available, but he's actually helping them find jobs as well so that they don't need to have the services. But nevertheless, again, there are more people who are vets and families of vets who need assistance. So that accounts for the increase. Are we gonna, uh, will they need a reserve fund transfer request this year? No. Not that she knows of. Okay. Didn't they last year? Yeah. They did last well, year. Well, I'm just looking here. Expenditure for fiscal 2015 was 433000 Right. right. Um, and remember, we had to transfer money there. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what the status is. Well, I'll ask her, but it didn't come up that that would happen. So I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. Well, if she, if, if, uh, if they could, you know, they, they, they could push this out on a monthly basis and give some sense of what what they'll need. But if, if you could ask that, I think that would be helpful. Carol? Okay. I was just surprised to see this number drop so much um, from the 433 to the 360 and then back up to 375 and to be that far off of the 433. Yeah, I think... I'm trying to remember the timing of the reserve fund transfer last year, uh, but it could be that we got clobbered after these budgets had gone to print. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so that's why the 360 is right. as low as it was versus spending 423. So my guess is that was, that was what would happen. Um, but I think it would be helpful um, if, if they could sort of start projecting ahead. Granted, it's only February, but if they see what they're spending on a monthly basis and then and project that ahead, that'll give, at least give some idea whether they're going to need more money or not. Okay. All right, so I'll go back and ask her, but she didn't, it didn't seem to be an issue at the time. I mean, we were talking about the increase and for when she did the budgets, uh, you know, all I can say is for when she did the budgets, this is what she anticipated. Okay. Um, but did she anticipate 15 If memory serves me right, in, in 2015, there was some type of change, was change involving in veterans. Right. That particular State, federal budget cycle. law. That, that's why you want to have a little bit. But I can't remember what it was. Yeah. But 
but it was, but, yeah, it was but a pretty big increase, and it, but there was some change in, in veterans, I don't veterans remember. services that uh, they had participated in. Okay, do you have any further thoughts for? No, if we don't, if you want me to wait and get an answer before we vote I on it. I don't think we need it. It's just reserve fund transfer is a separate issue. Okay. Uh, so what are you recommending? It, as printed, the uh, 439,642. Is there a second? Second. Okay, questions, any more questions or discussion? When, when you do ask her, ask, ask her if the 15 is based is 15 more than she spent or 15 above the 360? Because I think Alan might be right that this 360 was printed before they finished asking us for money. Well, I think that's what was appropriated. Yeah, it's not the actual oh, appropriated with the reserve fund. I assume yeah. that's what was appropriated in the uh, by town meeting. Which yeah. doesn't include the reserve fund transfer. No. Um, Veterans. No, the actual. Budget. Yeah, 360 is what was appropriated by town meeting. Uh, you know, and then the reserve fund transfers were done in June. Right. So. Yeah. Okay, well, we talked so about this early last year. I'm sorry. We Dean? talked about this early last year. We yeah. talked about this. It was before we printed the books, so the number yeah. might not be all that. This is the one where, if we remember, like the majority of the money gets 100% reimbursement from the state, and then there's a small tranche that gets like a 75. Yep. I think I made that number up, but it sounds good. Seventy-five percent reimbursement from the state, and we had, we had spent a while on it. I don't think it's <laughs> seventy-five, but yes. So we do get most of it back. Okay. Uh -huh. And it comes and of course in. That just flows into a year later. Come, well, I bet it also comes in. I mean, you can't say we put this much out, we're getting reimbursed exactly this, because you know when it goes out and when it comes in, or it's all timing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So any other questions on veteran services? Okay, uh, motions were made and seconded for 439-642. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. 217-16. Mary Margaret, do you have any other budgets? I do, but I don't know. Do we have time? Oh, wait, we could do the next one, which is the Council on Aging. Okay. I think we'll make this the last one. All right, so there was, um, there are steps and COLA increases in some of these salaries. <coughs> um, not that big a jump. And um, <clears throat> the expenses are staying pretty much the same. So I don't really have much to say about this other than I think we should go with the as printed amount of 225,730. Second. They haven't used much of the reception support. Huh. They want an increase. In other words, what, why do they want an increase from 9,000 to 9,500? When last year they only spent six hundred and seventy-four dollars. Year before, well, yeah, the year it was the year before. And then the year before that, right? I think it has more to do with having a real person. I think we I had talked about this last year that um, they used to have just anybody <laughs> answering questions, and now they have. Um, a real person who does the referrals and answers the questions. So, they're so they don't because they used to have like this massive amount of um, volunteers and now they have a person who does that. But is it, it, why is it under um, expenses as opposed to being an employee? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So are they, are they paid like contract per diem, part-time per diem work? Are they paid like part-time per diem work and it doesn't include benefits? I, I think once you're getting a... Right. Uh, okay, I'll go back and ask yeah. her and come back. And I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing for a ZPA to not spend their $600 in, in you know, office supplies, but, you know, this is $9,500. 
We could build a statue for that. Just you know? <laughs> put up a lot of websites. <laughs> but not on the tales of mercy. <laughs> yeah. We could put up 10 websites for that. So yeah, if you could find out, is this a yeah. regular person? Uh, how is it done? And how come they only needed, you know, they spent 674 last year and 2,400 the year before. And why would they want a $500 increase? This is it great is. to be beating up on old people and it's on TV. Yes. <laughs> okay, is there any other questions on, on this issue, Charlie? No. Okay, I'm any other questions? Back and ask her. As long as she has to go back and ask about this, is there any other questions on the Council on Aging budget? Okay, it is 10 o'clock. Charlie? Uh, quick question. At the special town meeting, uh, there's a resolution voted that we uh, that the reserve fund. Yeah, extra money for the payment of uh, the modulars at the at the Thompson. And, and have you had any requests for the Um, no. Oh, sorry, Charlie, I couldn't hear. What I said, you said. I said the, the um, at the special town meeting there was a resolution passed that we appropriate money from the um, reserve fund for the modulars at the Thompson. And I was just asking if we had any requests for those funds from the school department because. Um, I think the people in the in East Arlington are looking forward to uh, positive action in that regard. So I will. Uh, I'll call about. the manager on the modulars for the just to see the status. We okay. have a meeting of the uh, of the uh, enrollment task force next week. Yep. So it would be good to have that in order. Yep. Uh, if anybody has any, uh, okay, good. What's the was those modulars included on the Stratton? They were trying to negotiate the two we put down there. Uh, and, and I know that that, that, that uh, process on the Stratton modulars had some hiccups. Okay. Um, next week is going to be the uh, uh, besides our FinCon meetings on Tuesday is a uh, another meeting of the enrollment task force and. Uh, Charlie and myself are on it, and uh, we, we have a, we've been consulting with the education subcommittee of this group to get ideas, but so far I've gotten about, round numbers, 40 emails uh, declaring that the Odyssey is too much too big, and what we ought to do is take over the Gibbs and uh, make it into a second uh, middle school. I've gotten 48 emails, approximately, from the uh, Gibbs tenants saying that don't you dare touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly from the Council on Arts or um, community down there. So uh, this is going to be, you know, Solomon dividing the baby. Uh, uh, so it's going to be an interesting. If anybody has any, you know, ingenious solutions to this, uh, we'd be we'd love to hear it uh, on that. Okay, uh, so we'll be Monday, hopefully more, many more budgets. Yeah, Charlie? Yeah, I'd like to see a negotiation by the Board of Selectmen with the MUGAR people and see if we can't get a community center out of this development. So we can see something with the Center for the Arts. Any other business? Okay.